Good afternoon, everybody. I'm Peter Holland. I'm Associate Dean for the Arts in the College of Arts and Letters. Today's lecturer is Lee Gettler, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Anthropology, uh, and he is director of the Hormones, Health, and Human Behavior Lab, uh, three H's in its title, but obviously there isn't an H to describe behavior, or it would be four. Uh, Lee is a Notre Dame graduate. He graduated from Notre Dame in, in 2005, summa cum laude, and then went off to uh, Northwestern to do his PhD in anthropology. In 2012, on completing his PhD, he joined Notre Dame's faculty, initially uh, as an assistant research professor, and now since 2014 uh, as an assistant professor. He's a faculty affiliate of the Eck Institute for Global Health and the William J. Shaw Center for Children and Families. And his research, as his topic today shows, focuses on how men's biology responds to fatherhood and how that biology relates to men's roles within families and relates to their own health. During his time here, his research has expanded to focus on the biology and health of families much more broadly. In settings such as here in the US, in the UK, in the Philippines, and the Republic of the Congo, he studies how parents shape their children's growth, health, and biology, including their hormones, immune systems, and gene regulation. He is, as he says, a, the proud parent of two toddlers who will appear regularly in photos during this talk. Please welcome Lee Gettler. All right, folks, can you hear me well? Uh, so thank you, uh, Peter, for that uh, generous introduction, and I'm really grateful to the Arts and Letters College for inviting me to be part of the Saturday Scholars uh, series. It's a great honor. Um, today I'm going to talk to you quite a bit about what I would call the biology of fatherhood. Um, briefly, an anecdote from today that may or may not have anything to do with the biology of fatherhood, but uh, prior to uh, coming down to the the museum this morning, I waited in the long line at Starbucks, got my venti cold brew coffee, and was standing outside, it was raining a little bit, and of course I'm kind of rehearsing my talk in my mind and watching some Virginia fans trickle by me and then realized that I had dressed myself in Virginia colors. So whether I can blame that on my uh, parenting brain as the tired parent of two young children, I'm not sure, um, but I thought it was at least pointing out that we could think of this as how welcoming Notre Dame is, I guess. I, I went so far as to dress in other team's colors. Um, my family was not as impressed when I texted them about this. Um, so getting back to the theme here, um, there's a lot of reasons to care about the biology of fatherhood. I'm going to talk to you about um, a couple of them today, which is one, these are the biological mechanisms that relate to what men do in families and how they support their partners and take care of their kids. Um, there are also pathways through which men's health are affected, but as a biological anthropologist, um, I'm really interested in those questions, but also what this might tell us about human evolution. And so to, to kind of step back and think about human fathers in an evolutionary perspective, I think it's usual or um, important to point out that human fathers are actually relatively or quite unusual compared to other mammals. In other mammalian species, only around 3 to 5% of all mammalian species have biparental care where mothers and fathers are cooperating to raise young. Um, and those, uh, the other 95% is just mothers who are solely responsible for taking care of their young. And if we focus in a bit more on our closest relatives, the great apes, um, what we see is that none of these species show kind of the intensive, um, consistent, and diverse array of fathering behaviors that we see in humans across virtually all societies around the world. So what this tells us in terms of human evolution is that this is likely a set of kind of behavioral propensities that emerged or were derived in the course of our evolutionary history. Um, in addition to that, however, humans are not just unique in the sense that fathers cooperate with mothers to raise young, um, again, um, in, in societies around the world, but also that oftentimes all these other folks, um, kind of it, it takes a village, it takes a community, all these other folks cooperate with families to help raise young, and particularly if we look at um, small-scale societies, 
um, where communities are kind of subsisting off the land and they're living in much smaller communities. Um, oftentimes older siblings, um, grandmothers, and adults without children actually uh, play a really critical role in allowing the nuclear family to um, support their children in these ener energetically demanding ecologies. So given the kind of rise of these observations about the role that other caregivers have played or play in societies around the world, it's helped raise some questions about um, how reliable fathers may have been evolutionarily and, and what roles they were, were potentially playing. One of the challenges with that is if we're going back into the evolutionary past, we're pretty limited in terms of what lines of evidence we have available to us. For the most part, the, the kind of core lines of evidence that a paleontologist would use would be the fossil record um, or the archeological record, what material evidence um, did our ancestors leave behind. If we're thinking about kind of the roles that fathers played, there's general consensus that kind of fathers provisioning of resources, going out and getting energetic resources from the environment and bringing them back to their families and their communities was probably important evolutionarily as it is in many societies today. I've always been particularly interested in the role of fathers as direct caregivers, so kind of hands-on caregivers. Now, related to this question about lines of evidence, this is a real um, conundrum, how you think about and reconstruct whether fathers were doing this evolutionarily and whether it was important or not. Um, the joke I kind of make here typically, um, which is probably a dad joke, frankly, um, but is that we're not gonna go to the archeological record and find the Homo erectus baby Bjorn and be able to say that fathers were carrying around their young in the way that I'm carrying around my son in this picture. And we're not gonna find a, a bathing basin that we can attribute to early humans and a role of fathers specifically. And so that leaves us in a place where we need to think kind of more broadly about what lines of evidence we might use to reconstruct the possibility of fathers as direct caregivers. And so what I have argued and some other folks who work in this area in my field have argued is that we can actually look at contemporary male biology and look for physiological signatures of responsiveness to direct caregiving as well as kind of the transition to fatherhood in general and that that can give us some indicators as to whether those roles were evolutionarily salient. So if we see these kind of signatures in contemporary male biology, it may tell us something about what was evolutionarily relevant and salient in our past. The, kind of framework for being able to generate these questions and predictions really comes from a comparative biology perspective. Um, what we know is that across other vertebrates, including a handful of mammalian lineages, um, biparental care, care by both parents, um, has evolved independently multiple times. Um, we also share biological axes and systems with those other vertebrate species. And what you see, um, and as I'll show you in kind of the next slide, is that when biparental care evolves when invested fatherhood evolves in vertebrates, um, natural selection tends to kind of co-opt the same physiological signals to help promote that investment by fathers. And so this gives us kind of a, a firm foundation to ask some questions about um, human male biology and fathering. Um, in particular, across other species uh, where fathers are involved, during the periods when they're cooperating with mothers to raise offspring, they often show a suite of hormonal characteristics which usually involve um, at least some of these hormones that I have listed up here, but they usually have lower testosterone, elevated oxytocin, and elevated prolactin. Um, in the context of what the, that kind of profile does for fathering behavior or male's behavior, it tends to reduce male's kind of orientation towards competition, um, particularly competition for other mating opportunities. Um, and it tends to promote their cooperation with mothers and kind of focuses them in on the needs of the mother and their, their offspring. And it particularly helps um, oftentimes facilitate kind of increased direct care in these other species. In today in my talk, I'm gonna talk to you a lot about testosterone. I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about oxytocin and I have data on prolactin um, from some of the studies I've done, but I'm not gonna touch on that today. I'm happy to answer some questions about it. In general, if we're talking about kind of human physiology or behavioral physiology, we generally see that elevated testosterone is associated with a, a kind of suite of behaviors that may not be particularly conducive to cooperating well with a mother um, to raise young, particularly if you're a father who's engaging in kind of sensitive and nurturing care. Um, I don't have time to walk through all of that today because I'm probably gonna be short on time as it is. Um, 
but what I want to do is set up kind of where we were at about 10 years ago, maybe a little bit earlier, in terms of questions that had been asked about testosterone in human fathers kind of prior to the longitudinal work that my colleagues and I have done. And there was a, uh, someone in my field named Peter Gray who had done a number of studies in some different parts of the world showing um, with relatively small correlational studies that f married fathers tended to have lower testosterone, so that group on the far right there, married fathers tended to have lower testosterone than single non-fathers. There were some lab-based studies that had been done that showed that fathers, you bring them into a lab, you expose them to kind of recorded infant cries, and those that had lower testosterone basically indicated they, they really felt like they needed to respond to those distressed infants, so kind of a more sympathetic response to infant needs. Um, and then there were some hints that in cultural contexts where fathers were spending more time near kids and were more involved with childcare, that that might be related to lower testosterone in dads. Um, some of the limitations, these studies were really important and foundational, but they were cross-sectional, so they weren't following men through time. It's more like a snapshot in time. Um, and so they, as a consequence of that study design, um, they're not able to really address uh, what is driving what in terms of fatherhood and testosterone. Um, put another way, the question was kind of open as to whether it was the case that men with lower testosterone were more likely to become involved fathers, or whether the transition to fatherhood um, kind of preceded declines in testosterone. So we had a chicken and an egg issue going on here. I've been fortunate to be able to address uh, some of these questions in a big, large longitudinal study um, in Cebu City in the Philippines. Uh, Cebu City is the second largest metropolitan area uh, in the Philippines behind Manila. It's currently home to almost two million people. The study that I work on is called the Cebu Longitudinal Health and Nutrition Survey. It's a little bit of a, a mouthful, so if I refer to it again, I'll probably just refer to it as the Cebu study. Um, but this study was started in 1983 and 84, and they enrolled 3,300 pregnant women in the study at that time. Um, so these men are about the same age as I am. I was born in 1982. But the, the babies that were born in 1983 and 84 have been followed up at all of these waves of data collection across their lives. Um, and I'm gonna talk to you a little bit about data that we collected uh, when they were 21 and 22 years old, and then again when they were 26. So we have about a four and a half year uh, period between these two time frames when they were adults. So that design that I just laid out to you, this big longitudinal study, um, helps us get around some of those questions about correlation and what is driving what, and I'll talk a little bit about that. But Cebu is also a really fantastic place if you're interested, well, it's a fantastic place in general, but if you're interested in these questions about how men's biology might relate to differences in parenting, um, Cebu is not unlike the United States where you get a range of variation in how much men are doing in their families and how much uh, kind of direct care and time they spend in proximity to their kids. Um, here we have a, a fairly large proportion of the men in our study who are reporting spending at least upwards of an hour. Um, I have this described as hands-on care on the bottom, but it really encompasses both hands-on care and proximity to their kids. So essentially we have a large number of men who are spending at least some time um, taking care of their kids and in kind of close proximity to them on a daily basis. So the major question we're trying to ask here is whether between ages 21 and 26, if you transition to partnered fatherhood, what happens to your testosterone? To do that, you really have to, isol to isolate the effects of marriage and fatherhood. You have to start with a big group of men who haven't experienced either of those things. Um, and again, with the large scope of the Cebu study, we were able to do that with 465 men at age 21. So the first thing I'm going to show you, I'm going to, I'm going to show you the changes in testosterone a bit more clearly in a subsequent slide, but what I want to point out to you here, this is, so here are the men who are single non-fathers at both time points. Here are the men who become uh, essentially newly married non-fathers and the newly married new fathers. What you can see is that actually in all three of these groups, there's, there's at least some decline in their testosterone between those two time points. Um, what I want to orient you towards is that we actually found that men who have higher testosterone when they're single non-fathers are more likely to become married fathers by the time they're 26. So that kind of, at least at this site, puts to rest the question of whether lower testosterone men are more likely to become fathers. What we find is that it's the higher testosterone men who are more likely to make that transition. And then their testosterone goes down, at least on average. And so here, again, men who stay single non-fathers on the far left, you get a little bit of uh, change on average in their testosterone. Men who become newly partnered 
or newly married non-fathers are in the middle, and then men who become newly, pari- newly partnered new fathers are on the far right. And their testosterone is declining on average up to 25%. To put that in kind of context, if we did a big uh, study of men's testosterone across the United States and looked at men in different, um, different decades of their life, um, a 25% difference is basically the equivalent of about two decades of aging in terms of differences in testosterone between men in the United States. So for men in their 20s to experience kind of this scope of testosterone change with the transition to fatherhood is a very kind of biologically meaningful um, change. These men are in their kind of reproductive primes. If we look at how this varies based on the age of men's youngest child, we see that men who have newborns at home experience a very large change in their testosterone on average, up to almost 50% um, in terms of the decline in their testosterone. And then if we kind of scale that out based on the age of men's youngest children, what you see is this kind of J-shaped curve where men's testosterone is kind of creeping back up to where they were before they were fathers. We know, or before they were married fathers, we know that it never, it doesn't quite get back to where they were in their early 20s. But this pattern, we have to be careful about extrapolating too much of, um, from contemporary populations into the evolutionary past. But this pattern actually makes sense from an evolutionary perspective. It would not make sense to become a father in your early 20s, have your testosterone plummet, and then have it permanently stay down. That's not a, humans are not a kind of one and done um, species in terms of reproduction. So the fact that this might come up as your child is moving out of that hyperdependency period and when you might be starting to get even more help from other people in your community makes some sense evolutionarily. And then if we look at this in terms of uh, how this relates to men being first time fathers or whether they have multiple children in our sample, we see that the change in testosterone is roughly the same whether men have one child or multiple kids. And so with that J-shaped curve, essentially what we would see is men's testosterone starts to creep back up and then if they have another baby, it seems to drop back down kind of equivalently. So this isn't a one-time change. We see, see kind of dynamism in this system in terms of how testosterone is relating to men's uh, transition to parenthood. The next question we were interested in is whether there is potentially some kind of functional Uh, correlates of these changes in testosterone in men. So we wanted to look at um, whether men's testosterone is related to how much childcare they do. Um, If we look at this, these are the same categories I showed you um, in terms of how much caregiving and proximity uh, men have to their kids on a daily basis. And we see that men who are doing the most childcare in this setting have pretty substantially lower testosterone than uh, men who are reporting not engaging in that kind of care and not spending time around their kids on a daily basis. Uh, with the other two categories kind of intermediate. Um, Some of my photos are a little dark here, um, but um, I'll talk about this in a second. Men, um, we also wanted to look at whether men who are sleeping near their families and near their kids have lower testosterone. In the Philippines, um, what what we call same surface co-sleeping, it's essentially like bed sharing like I'm doing with my son there. Um, They don't sleep in typically in beds like we do. They're more often sleeping on kind of mats on the floor, um, kind of thin mattresses on the floor in our sample. But nonetheless, if they're sharing a sleeping surface with their children, their testosterone is substantially lower than if their kids are sleeping um, in a room by themselves. And this is independent of what they're doing during the day. So we seem to at least be picking up two um, kind of correlative indicators that if you're spending more time near your kids during the day or if you're sleeping with them at night, both of those things are related to lower testosterone. Um, in, in men in Cebu. Um, this is me um, sharing a bed with, with my firstborn, who's now five. Um, I can tell you that, um, unfortunately, he wakes up many times per night, and we basically end up sleeping in the same position in his bed. Um, and in that picture, you see a tired father with low testosterone. And right now, the reason I needed so much caffeine is because I think my testosterone is probably still low. Um, so. Those data are cross-sectional, again, right? I I raised this as an issue with some of the early studies on um, marital and fathering status and testosterone. So basically, we don't know what's driving what. It could be the case that fatherhood um, initiates this decline in testosterone, and that might relate to men increasing their investment in childcare. Um, There's some uh, good research that's come out in the last few years about this. Um, There's a really nicely done uh, study by some folks up at the University of Michigan. Um, We can forgive them for being at Michigan. They're good scientists. Um, They tracked men through their partner's pregnancies, so they're looking at expectant fathers, and they found that men, if men's testosterone declines more during their partner's pregnancies, they're more involved 
with childcare when their babies are born, they're more involved with household tasks, and their partners re report kind of feeling better supported by them. Uh, we did a study here locally in South Bend um, in collaboration with Memorial Hospital um, where we collected samples from men within the first hour of when their babies were born, um, including before and after they did skin-to-skin -skin care with their babies on the birthing unit, and then the next day when they were on the mother-baby uh, recovery unit. And what we found is that on those first days around when their babies are born, if men have lower testosterone, it is predictive of how much childcare they're doing a few months later uh, when the baby has gone home and um, the family's kind of adjusting to that new reality of having a relative newborn around. And so both of these studies are consistent with the idea that you're getting this kind of initiation of testosterone change and then it's potentially predictive um, of, of what fathers are doing within their families later. Um, my uh, former postdoctoral research, Patty Quo, was the lead author on this, and she's now at the University of Nebraska. The other possibility is that some men become fathers, they get more involved with childcare, and that leads to a decrease in testosterone. Um, we were able to explore some of this in the context of our longitudinal data from Cebu, and one of the things that I've kind of long argued is that this is potentially a, a feedback loop where you get this change in testosterone, during pregnancy, it may lead some men to be more involved with childcare and then spending more time in proximity to their families and kind of being more invested in that way potentially helps, uh, affects their brain and uh, has these cascading effects in terms of keeping their testosterone down. In the context of Cebu, the earlier slides I showed you were based on men who are single non-fathers when they were 21. In, in this data I'm gonna show you now, we're, we're looking at the men who were already fathers when they were 21. So we had about 100 men who had already become fathers by the time they were 21 years old. And what we see, if we look at their childcare, uh, how much childcare they're doing when they're 21 and again when they're 26, is that if dads decrease their childcare during that time frame, their testosterone comes back up. And if they increase their childcare between those two time frames, their uh, testosterone drops down again about about 20% for the men who are kind of substantially increasing their, their care, suggesting um, these two things are at least moving in tandem together. I don't have a lot of time to talk about, um, there's a lot of um, really rich research that's been done on the, uh, these questions about the biology of fatherhood around the world. Um, part of what I'm trying to show you here is that these patterns linking lower testosterone in fathers to more involvement in childcare and kind of spending more time with children um, have been found in a diverse array of ses, uh, societies around the world, both in industrialized societies and small-scale societies. Um, and so there seems to be something fairly robust about this correlation between testosterone and childcare. Um, however, we know that from some other early work, again by folks like Peter Gray, we know that there's also variation in this uh, this pattern where fathers and married men don't always have lower testosterone than non-fathers and in fact in some societies where uh, men can be polygynously married and have uh, multiple wives, in those contexts married fathers do not have lower testosterone than non-fathers on average. And so kind of thinking about this variation is part, um, was part of the foundation that led uh, me and my colleague Adam Boyette to start a new study a few years ago in the Republic of Congo where we're really interested in cultural differences in fathering and physiology. And we're looking at two small scale societies. One is a hunter gatherer or forager society called the Bayaka. And their neighboring society are the Bandongo who are fisher farmers. And so I'm gonna show you a little bit of our data um, from the Bandongo and talk a little bit about their kind of models of fatherhood and family life. So again, this is a small scale community they're living um, in a very remote region of uh, the Republic of the Congo, which is in central West Africa. Um, it takes about seven days to get to this field site. Um, you fly into the capital um, of ROC, and then it, by, by truck and boat and foot, um, it takes about seven days to get to them. So they're living really remotely um, in the forest. They, there's about 200 people, less than 200 people total in this community. Um, they subsist through kind of traditional farming, through slash and burn agriculture, so they're clearing plots in the forest and planting crops, and then they get a lot of their protein from fishing from the river. The society has a very rigid social hierarchy based on gender and age and acquired status. Um, I will, I'm raising that because it's actually relevant to some of the patterns we find for father's testosterone. I'll talk a little bit more that, about that in a second. Our study was really focused on going in establishing relationships with folks in these communities and trying to understand what they valued in terms of how fathers 
played roles in families and how fathers shape child health. Um, and what they reported to us is that fathers are really valued as providers of resources in this energetically challenging ecology. Um, and that fathers are really seen as kind of moral and social educators of children. They do not do direct caregiving. Fathers are not kind of warm and nurturing and sensitive in the way that is often valued, say, in the United States. Um, it, um, in this context, verbal and physical conflict between uh, men and women is, is not uncommon. Um, but it's kind of widely recognized that if fathers avoid this, it will benefit their children's health and well-being. So there's a recognition that that kind of marital conflict is bad for, for children. And then the last point I want to uh, make here before I show you some of the hormonal data is that uh, men's provider roles in this community are actually quite risky. Um, some of the resources that they acquire from trees, they're scaling very high trees while carrying tools like machetes. Um, and so they're putting their, themselves at risk, and men often do get hurt doing that. Um, they're clearing old growth forests through that kind of slash and burn agriculture approach, um, which is also risky for them, both in the cutting of the trees and the, the burning. And then finally, they do, a, they do the fishing on the river, and there's often, unfortunately, drowning deaths within the community. And so being on the river itself is dangerous, but then there's also dangerous animals in the river, like crocodiles. Um, so in total, men's provider roles are very dangerous, um, but they're also ways that they acquire status within the community. And so what we did in this small scale community is we're, we're, I'm gonna show you some data on their provider roles and their marital conflict dynamics. Because this community is small and the men have known each other basically their entire lives, what we were able to do is have them rank each other. So we had all the fathers rank one another um, in terms of how they felt, uh, where fathers, uh, pardon me, where fathers fell in terms of their uh, ranking within the community, in terms of how good of a provider they were and how much uh, marital conflict they had with their partners. And so what we see is that fathers who are better providers in this context have higher testosterone. So this is also an indicator that fathers who are better providers likely are higher status. And so this kind of actually accords with um, the idea or other findings we have in terms of what testosterone does in human um, social behavior in terms of facilitating kind of men's orientation towards competition and dominance status. Um, I'm gonna show you a little bit here um, in terms of how men's uh, roles as providers and their conflict with their wives relates to their oxytocin. Now, if any of you have, uh, know anything about oxytocin, um, it plays some really critical roles um, in terms of um, the birthing process and lactation in women, but it's also oftentimes presented in the media as kind of the bonding hormone, the love hormone. Um, that's an oversimplification. But in the context of, say, a father who's helping take care of his kids at night and is, is kind of sleeping next to them and behaving nurturingly with them, you might expect fathers doing that kind of behavior to have elevated oxytocin. It, it tends to be um, increased in the context of those kind of sensitive nurture and behaviors. Among the Bondongo, where that type of behavior is not valued among fathers, we actually find that fathers who are better providers have lower oxytocin. So we're seeing lower oxytocin and elevated testosterone in the context of their culturally valued dimensions of fatherhood. When we look at how this relates to men's conflict with their partners, we find that men who have more conflict with their partners also have lower oxytocin. Now, this is actually um, aligns with what you would expect um, kind of regardless of societal boundaries. So if we looked at this same question in the United States, um, you, would, you would find, and there's research on this, showing that um, couples that have greater kind of distress and greater conflict also have lower oxytocin relative to one another um, versus couples that are kind of more harmonious. So, this kind of aligns with the overarching understanding of how testosterone may um, relate to kind of uh, more better functioning in the context of supportive social relationships. So if we look at this together, we look at the profiles that fathers express for both of these hormones, what you see is that men who are seen as better providers have elevated uh, testosterone and lower oxytocin, and men who are seen as, as poor providers have the opposing profile. And then if we look at marital conflict, you see that men who have more marital conflict with their wives also have higher testosterone and lower oxytocin, and men who have uh, less marital conflict and more harmonious relationships have higher oxytocin and lower testosterone. So what we know from our work on children's health in this context is that men who are better providers 
have children who are in better energetic condition and show better growth in this context. But men who have uh, better relationships with their partners have children who have lower kind of physiological indicators of stress and also kind of uh, as, as measured through immune function. And they also have um, profiles for gene expression that seem to be related to, to better health. And so these are kind of two different um, dimensions of how father's biology might be related to different aspects of health in this community. This is actually particularly important if we're thinking about how this kind of variability in the biology of fatherhood may have been selected evolutionarily, but I think it also um, is consistent with the idea that there's a diverse array of ways to be a potentially a good father or a poten potentially benefit your kids in the context of this society as well as ours. And we're really just kind of starting to scratch the surface in understanding um, how these different biological signals interact within men to kind of shape different dynamics within families. So if I can summarize this briefly, and then I'm going to talk to you for a few minutes about um, some of the findings we have relating um, some of these uh, profiles for testosterone to men's health. Um, we see that human males have a neuroendocrine arch architecture that's potentially evolved, but seems to be highly flexible and related to multiple ways of being a father, um, both within and across cultures. Um, the way in which this seems to function is that based on the, the kind of cultural context in which men um, are residing, their biology seems to respond to help kind of focus behavioral priorities within that specific context. The kind of last piece I'm going to um, bring together here, I spent a lot of time talking to you about the biology of fatherhood in the Philippines and the Republic of the Congo. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about these questions about men's health um, in the United States. So my colleagues and I have been using these large publicly available data sets from the US Centers for Disease Control um, to test some questions about variation in testosterone as it relates to parenting and partnering in men's health. What's great about this study known as the, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey is that it's, it's very large and it's nationally representative of the United States. And so the patterns that we're able to observe, say for young to middle-aged men, um, ages 20 to 40, are actually representative of the full population of men in that age range in the United States. And so the first study I'm gonna to talk to you about is we, uh, we affectionately refer to as the dad bod paper in my lab. Um, so uh, my graduate student and I wrote a, a, a blog post about this called On the Origins of Dad Bod. But the core question we're trying to ask here is whether um, there's kind of an intersection between men's partnering and parenting, testosterone, and, and their, uh, the amount of adiposity they're carrying on their bodies. And so to set this up, in societies like the United States, men who have lower testosterone tend to have higher adiposity, and this is actually kind of a feedback loop between the two as you tend to gain more um, adipose tissue, it reduces your circulating testosterone, which then predisposes you to putting on more adiposity and you can get feedback between the two. Men with lower testosterone in the US and Europe are also um, at greater risk of cardiovascular disease um, and cardiovascular disease related mortality. And then in the US and Europe, when men transition to marriage and fatherhood, they tend to gain weight. Their BMI tends to go up. They tend to gain weight around their bellies. Um, most studies that have been done on this have explored this through the, the lens of kind of health behaviors. So as men transition to fatherhood, oftentimes their work hours go up, their ability to get exercise goes down, their diet, um, dietary quality goes down because they're kind of like the garbage disposal for the family, so to speak. Um, and then there's some interesting questions about whether how much of this might be related to say sleep quality and increased stress among new parents. But no one had really asked the question of whether testosterone differences between men might help explain this. So that's what we did in this study. Um, one thing I'll show you, you have partnered fathers on the far right there and single non-fathers on the left, um, basically showing that uh, the pattern that we found in Cebu and that's been found in other studies of US men um, holds up in this nationally representative study. So you have men who are partnered fathers have significantly lower testosterone than non-fathers um, across this big study of US males. Um, the measure of adiposity that I'm gonna show you um, is called sagittal abdominal diameter. It's a little like waist circumference, but it's actually measuring how far the belly protrudes up um, when you're laying down. Um, the acronym for this is SAD. I don't make up the acronyms, I just report them. Um, 
this uh, SAD, sagittal abdominal diameter, is a measure, um, it's, it's thought to be a better measure of visceral adiposity. So visceral adiposity is the adipose tissue that builds up around your internal organs and is actually particularly unhealthy. It's also the type of adipose tissue that when men's testosterone goes down, um, not having that testosterone um, increases their propensity to putting on that kind of adiposity. Um, so this is probably particularly important in terms of understanding men's health. And so what we see is that partnered fathers, um, this doesn't look like a particularly large difference um, based on the, the kind of scoring here, but there's a significant difference between um, uh, single non-fathers and partnered fathers for this uh, measure of adiposity, which is kind of generally consistent with the past research. So we're gonna look at whether testosterone is in this pathway. And essentially, if you predict men's stomach uh, belly fat from their partnering and parenting status, you see that difference between single non-fathers and partnered fathers. If you put testosterone into that model from a statistical perspective, that difference goes away. So what this essentially means statistically is that men's testosterone differences between men in terms of testosterone is accounting for this. Partnered fathers have lower testosterone and higher belly fat, and, and their testosterone explains that difference, okay? Um, our long-term interest here um, is trying to explore whether the transition to parenthood and some of these biological changes might actually be predisposing men, say, in my generation to long-term health risks. Um, it's long been the case that married men, in particular in the United States, actually had better health outcomes um, than men who remained um, single and non-parents. Um, and so, but that's, that work was done more with my father's generation and people um, kind of of that age range. And so in terms of how maybe changing dynamics with what fathers are doing or new demands on families, uh, we're trying to understand what are the long-term health risks um, as it relates to this change in testosterone, which may be beneficial in a lot of ways in terms of what men may be, may be doing with the, in their families, but might not be particularly beneficial in terms of certain aspects of their health. The last um, piece of that puzzle that I'm gonna talk about that we've looked at, we, we were using that same data set, actually an even larger um, sample from the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, but we're looking at whether, kind of similar questions about whether differences in testosterone between partnered men partnered fathers and single non-fathers were related to depression risks. So why might this be the case? Well, clinically low testosterone is a pretty well-known risk factor um, for depression symptoms and clinical depression. Um, for fathers, it's possible that lower testosterone, that this kind of biology of fatherhood may get pushed too far in some men, um, and that that may increase their risk for depressive symptomology. Um, or it may be the case that say in higher risk um, social contexts, like being a, a low socioeconomic status father in the United States might particularly increase uh, your risk of depression. We know that lower socioeconomic status is a risk factor for depression. So if you have low testosterone as a father in that context, maybe you're at greater risk um, for depression, which is what we tested and we did not find that. We found actually the opposite of that. So over here, um, you have men who are kind of lower, uh, this is men who are lower socioeconomic status fathers. If their testosterone is higher, they have higher risks for depression. On the far right, you have men who are better educated fathers, so higher socioeconomic status fathers. And if, if those men have higher testosterone, they have almost no risk of depression. But men who are better educated and have lower testosterone, um, and this is right around the clinical cutoff of where a doctor might diagnose you as having low testosterone uh, from a clinical perspective, um, those men um, have pretty substantially increased risks of depression, at least relative to their, their peers who have higher testosterone. Um, so we need to kind of better understand the, the etiology of this um, from a kind of big uh, epidemiological perspective, I, I, so to speak, these men might be the ones who are kind of likely to be the most involved um, with childcare on a daily basis. And so maybe they're, maybe they're experiencing burnout or being spread too thin. Um, and that's why this is related to kind of increase in depression. Um, but this is something that kind of we need to continue to unpack a bit further. As an anthropologist, I wanna show you one last piece of this, which is just that 
there's a kind of a handful of teams that are looking at these questions across different um, cultural contexts. And what we see is some evidence in the United States that lower testosterone in fathers um, may be risk, a risk factor for depression. Um, we looked at this in the context of the Cebu study, and we have pretty good data on depression, and we don't find it there. And then I have a, a good friend of mine named Ben Trumbull looked at this among forager, um, hunter-gatherer, kind of horticulturalists in Bolivia, so in a small-scale society. And he found that under specific circumstances, um, when there was this catastrophic flood, if men's testosterone was really low following that flood, they were at much greater risk of depression. Um, so we're, we're still trying to kind of build a cross-cultural perspective on why um, men with low testosterone may be more at risk of depression in certain contexts versus others. Um, to kind of wrap up here, I think that these evolutionary perspectives gives us um, an understanding of why men's bodies may have these capacities to respond to different forms of invested fatherhood um, and how context may shape those dynamics, which again also makes sense in the context of the um, diversity of um, ecologies and environments in which our bodies um, evolved over the course of human history. Um, it's not a particularly probably compelling point to wrap up on, but I think um, what this cross-cultural research is showing us is that if our goal is to really understand what men are doing within families, um, particularly as it relates to benefiting children, um, the biological perspective can, can give us some insights there, but we need to continue to kind of refine our perspectives on how these different physiological signals emerge in kind of different fathers' bodies, what that might mean for what they're doing within families, um, and how that might relate to their own health and well-being, which itself can relate to their ability to kind of be supportive parents and to um, optimally um, shape the environment of their children. Thank you. Um, I just want to acknowledge um, I, I'm fortunate to get to work with a lot of really great um, populations around the world. We're very thankful to them. I have a great um, group of collaborators I get to work with, and lots of people have generously supported this research, both um, funding organizations and the, the uh, universities. And uh, go Irish, and here's my daughter catching a football. <laughs> Happy to answer some questions. Yeah, I had to throw, well, she's, she's catching a Vikings ball, and since they're playing the Bears, I had to throw that in there as a good Minnesotan, but. Yeah. Well, if lower testosterone is associated with higher health risks for mm -hmm. males, uh, is there any thought, and I, I hesitate to say this because I don't believe in it, uh, to giving artificial uh, testosterone to change that? So I, I have to be honest with you, I've been a little fearful that all of the ads you see on TV, um, that they'll eventually glom onto this idea that men's testosterone goes down when they become fathers. Um, for the most part, most of the, the changes that I'm describing in the context of these studies, most of the men are not experiencing testosterone changes that would push them to a level that's kind of below a clinical threshold for lower testosterone. Um, and so, you know, the, that last point that I wrapped up on in terms of that we really, we, there's not that many people that work on these questions, which is kind of good for me as a scientist, but not so great in terms of our understanding of the implications of this for human health. So I think we need to understand why some men may experience really dramatic drops or why particularly low testosterone in some men may increase their likelihood for depression. I don't think we're there yet in terms of understanding that. And so I agree with you that just having men come in and if we're testing their testosterone in the context of a, a clinical office and they're below a clinical threshold for low testosterone, that doesn't mean that they have depression or that they are at a long-term risk for, for CVD. Um, it doesn't also necessarily mean that they're a particularly invested in good father either. So I don't, I don't think that that would be a, a good intervention for medical doctors to take at this time um, and I don't think we know enough about what would predispose some men to bad, poor health outcomes as are related to this that we would want to go that route yet. Um, that one of the things that I, uh, I talk about this a lot when I teach on this because it makes my students laugh and kind of gives them an understanding of the challenges of going to the level of the individual. Um, when my son was a baby, 
um, so five years ago, and I was just kind of getting my lab up and running. I had, um, my wife and I were both um, spitting in tubes to, to run our hormones as kind of like test subjects for my lab um, to see if we were getting the right levels of testosterone. Um, and when one of my undergraduates ran all those samples, he thought it was really funny because my, my pregnant wife's testosterone was higher than mine. Um, and then when we looked at where my testosterone was in terms of like a distribution, it basically I looked like a breastfeeding mom. And, but I wasn't depressed and I was still pretty physically fit. And so it's just really challenging to know. And the other piece of that is my testosterone's actually always been pretty low. It was pretty low when I was a graduate student too, relative to like normal variation. And so my testosterone went down to a really low level where if I went in to get it tested, I would look like I needed like a testosterone supplement. But actually for me, it wasn't that low. And so I think that as, if insurance companies will pay for it and if we continue to, to think about the implication of testosterone for men's health, understanding, getting a longitudinal perspective for each guy is actually really important because men, men have this huge range of variation for where their, where their testosterone is. Um, and so the decline is actually matters most within the individual, if that makes sense. Um, and so coming in and just getting a one-time test of your testosterone is actually not gonna tell you that much about your health and biology. So we just, it really, at this point, mostly just us. Um, but we just published that research that I was showing you um, really within the last year or two. And so hopefully, in the future, other research teams will pick up some of that. Um, I can tell you that in, the, in that context, so again, that's a, um, a, a traditional farming community living in a very energetically and and disease challenging ecology, both all of which affects child growth. The reason that the kids, when dads have higher testosterone and their, their kids are growing better, it's because those dads are getting more resources from the environment. So the kids are, actually, are in nutritional, they're nutritionally better off, I guess would be um, a way of putting that. And the more resources the kids can get in that context, it's just more energy they can allocate or, or put towards growth um, because they're not having to take so much energy to fight off um, disease and things of that nature. The other side of that, there is a lot of really rich research um, from, say, developmental psychology, including here at Notre Dame, um, that looks at how family conflict um, negatively influences kids' um, stress and their mental well-being. And so that finding... Um, is actually pretty consistent with just other things you see, regardless of whether it's a small-scale society or you know, a society like the United States, kids are just very sensitive to their family environments. And when there's a lot of conflict between parents, it's gonna have detrimental um, effects on their, their physiology um, and kind of their, their long-term um, mental and cognitive development, frankly. Yeah. Does that help a little bit? I think there's a question right there. Yeah. yeah you know, I found it very interesting that dads who are not only day to day active in their child's care matters, but even the one slide you had where even passively, whether they're in sleeping in the same room yeah. on the same level, that mattered. I was wondering if you've looked in some of your data analysis, whether going to the other extreme, whether dads who are maybe in the military yeah. or who are 
truck drivers, long distance truck drivers who are still in that by parent co parenting model, but not physically within proximity, whether their testosterone is different. I do not know the answer to that. I think it's a great question. I mean, one of the things, I think I, um, in response to the first question, I said that uh, unfortunately there are not that many people working on these issues. Um, I, that, I always get really great questions about um, adopted fathers and stepfathers. Um, and, and this is another type of question that, that comes up a lot. And I don't know the answer to it. I, I think that there's an aspect of kind of emotional and, and cognitive commitment where I could see men who are away because they're deployed in the military, but who you know, are, are remaining in close contact with their family and feel that you know, part of what they're doing abroad is really you know, protecting their family and things like that. I, I could see the physiology still being active. I mean, it's all happening at the level of the brain. So, um, I, I could see that that kind of emotional investment could still have this cascading effect on the biology, but um, it's, it's a really important set of questions that we just haven't been able to explore yet. Um, part of the reason I raised this issue of, well, we have these findings from a number of different cultural contexts around the world, but including my work about childcare and proximity and lower testosterone, that part of the interesting aspect of this is men don't actually do that much direct childcare around the world. Um, including, I mean, in the United States, I'd say on average, it's increasing quite a bit. But when I was, so going back to kind of my generation, when I was a kid in the 80s, fathers were not doing all that much um, in terms of direct hands-on childcare on average. Um, and you still see that in a lot of cultures around the world where it's just not the role that fathers play in a lot of families. And so this, this is actually a, a debate that I get into with a lot of my anthropology colleagues where they're like, well, Okay, so you're you're finding this correlation with childcare and testosterone, but fathers don't actually do childcare in in all these different societies. So why does this really matter? Or would it have been important evolutionarily? And so that seems to be the the correlation that we have. But what is actually driving it at the level of the brain is still an open question. Yeah. I guess this is similar to that. <laughs> sure. In terms of, uh, what is the physiological or medical, biological factors affecting production and control of testosterone? And make, you're looking at an end result, but yeah. stress, I imagine, is got a big one. Yeah, it's, it's, so the one, I mean, um, part of the important question, particularly about father cell, I showed that, that slide where fathers who have newborns have this very large drop in testosterone. Um, I would say stress and sleep play a, a pretty big role in that. We know that if father's sleep is disrupted, or if men's sleep is disrupted, it doesn't have to be fathers, um, their testosterone will go down. And so we try to adjust for that um, in, when we're running our, our statistical models, but um, no one has done a really rigorous study of the role of sleep in contributing to some of these patterns. Um, in terms of what is regulating testosterone, you're right, we're looking at the kind of end product um, from an axis that starts at the level of the brain. Um, we were able to collect um, blood from men when they were 21 in the Philippines. And so upstream of testosterone being produced by the testes is luteinizing hormone, which comes from the pituitary gland. And so what we saw in the, the Filipino men when they're 21 is that the men who are fathers also have lower luteinizing hormone, which is why I say it's all happening at the level of the brain, because that's, that's the step that's directly downstream from the brain. Um, now, there's, it doesn't 100% guarantee that this is happening in the brain, but it, my overwhelming hunch um, or hypothesis, to be more scientific, um, is that this has to do with sensory input to the brain as well as kind of um, emotional and cognitive investment in the family and that through brain-based pathways, you get effects on the hypothalamus, which then affects the pituitary, which then affects the testes production of testosterone. Does that help a little bit? Okay. I think there was one over here. Is there any research on men who have had vasectomies? 
Not that I know of, but um, the specific um, surgical effect of a vasectomy would not affect their testosterone production per se. Um, it just affects their ability to produce sperm that would uh, lead to a pregnancy, successful pregnancy. Um, so if it had an effect on these kind of social um, physiological dynamics I'm describing, um, I would think it would be more through, um, actually, I don't even, I probably shouldn't even speculate on that. It should, it wouldn't, it, it doesn't, it would not have a specific effect on their testosterone or their ability to um, downregulate their testosterone if they adopted a baby or something like that. Um, yeah, or maybe back there. Yeah, um, I'm just wondering, given the kind of consistency of uh, your studies as well as those of other uh, researchers on the effects, of, apparent effects of testosterone, how confident are you that that uh, you know there may not be you know uh, that this may, there may not be covariance that this might be some spurious effect of other uh, of other hormones or perhaps behavioral uh, uh, things that are affecting those. <laughs> Pretty confident. Um, I part of the reason that um, when I talk about when I you know give that initial um, spiel in the early part of my talk about that if we're interested in thinking about kind of direct caregiving in the evolutionary past, we can look at physiological signals of this in contemporary male biology. Um, is because that this pattern where low testosterone is correlated with fathers being more cooperative and doing more care of their offspring shows up in all of these different animal species. Um, and that really serves as kind of the foundation for making that same prediction about human fathers. Um, I didn't say this in my slides, but scientists who study birds, ornithologists, have known about this since like the late 70s. I mean, they were, they were asking these questions about bird fathers 20 or 30 years before people started asking um, them about humans. And actually, the the theoretical foundation that really anthropologists translated to asking these questions about humans came from birds. Um, it's called the challenge hypothesis. But um, th I think that's part of what gives me confidence is that it shows up in all these different species that are not that closely related. Let me also to uh, leave just one change of an acronym that became so important. Not sagittal adiposity dimension, but sagittal adiposity growth which would then give us the acronym SAG. <laughs> it feels as though he's sagging. Thank you, wonderful talk. <laughs>